So let me first say thank you for the invitation to come here. I've, I've enjoyed everything I've seen of the event so far. Um, this first talk is going to hopefully repeat a lot of things you already heard from Ritwick, uh, who gave an introduction to gromov witten theory. Uh, and I will give my first, first portion of my mini-course a similar title. And my goal for today will mainly be to introduce all the notation and terminology that I need in the next three lectures. And uh, in particular, I want to get to a point where we can define this notion of super rigidity and tell you a little bit about what it means intuitively and what it's good for. And that will be the focus starting from tomorrow. So just to go back a little bit to motivation for gromov witten theory, we have this classical question from enumerative algebraic geometry. And I'm personally very much not an algebraic geometer, but I also can agree that uh, this seems like a natural question. So in talking about something like a complex algebraic variety, or if you prefer, you can talk about a complex manifold, x, question is how many algebraic curves are there through a given set of points? And in order to make this a, a well-defined question that has a nice, nice answer, I should say how many so complex algebraic curves are there let's say, of genus G, since we're talking about complex curves, so these are maps from Riemann surfaces into X, they have some genus. And some degree, which I'll discuss a little bit in a moment what that means. Uh, and I want to say through M points, but in order for this to have a well-defined answer, I need to modify that a bit and say through M generic points. This word generic is going to come up quite a lot, uh, and it may be a little bit frustrating that I won't tell you precisely what it means in every case. So what it means in general is uh, it might not be possible to define precisely what it means for a set of M points to be generic, but if you're given a set of M points, you can always perturb them a little bit. In fact, a, a random perturbation will almost certainly lead you to a so-called generic set of points. So within the, sets, uh, within the set of all m tuples of points, the generic ones are abundant, they're dense. That's one of the basic assumptions. And the claim is that this question then has a, a, a well-defined answer if you allow points to vary within the set of generic m tuples. So, an example for which we can answer the question immediately. There's this classical observation that there exists a unique complex line through any two points. Let's say in C2. Right? So, in particular, given two points, you can find an affine map from C to C2. I wrote linear, but I really mean affine. You can add constants to, the, to a linear map. Uh, and it's a useful observation that this map can be extended to a map between certain closed complex manifolds as well, in a natural way, because C sits as a subset of complex projective space, CP1. It's a set of all equivalence classes represented by point 1, Z, in CP1. C2, of course, similarly looks like a set of all equivalence classes 1, Z1, Z2. In CP2, 
So initially, you can think of this line between two points as something sitting in C2, but it also extends to a holomorphic map from CP1 to CP2. Right. That's easy to check that that's true for any affine map. This map from CP1 to CP2 is what we call a rational curve. Rational refers to the fact that the domain of the curve has genus 0, genus 0 Riemann surface. And if you see what this extended map does to the fundamental class of CP1, the fact that F started out as a line means that when you extend it, what you get over here is going to be some generator of H2 of CP2, since the letter is the integers. So this is what we mean when we say that F has degree 1. OK? So more generally, you can talk about holomorphic maps from CP1 to CP2 And this is a definition. We say that such a map has degree d if it pushes forward the generator of H2 of CP1 to d times your favorite generator of H2 of CP2. So, you can ask a related question, right? How many rational curves are there of a given degree d through some set of points? And you need to choose the number of points you're talking about appropriately for there to be a well-defined count. Because each point applies some constraints to a family of rational curves that may exist. And that family has a certain dimension. So classically, there's some number that one defines. And also, these rational curves, they need not always be embedded. So the number is called n sub d. The number of rational curves of degree d in CP2 through, turns out the right number of constraints is 3d minus 1 generic points. Because if you require them to pass through fewer points than that, you'll have a family of curves that do, and then you don't have a finite count. If you require more points than that, then for a generic set of points, no curves will pass through all of them. Yeah? Good. So I don't want to say much more about this, but of course, the answer to the original question was 1. That gives you the value of n1. You can have, in general, some finite set satisfying these constraints. And these numbers have been computed. I'll write down the answer just because it's sort of impressive when you see it. Right? So we observe that n2, in particular, is 1. Turns out n3 is also known, that's equal to 12. n4 is 620. n5 is 87,304, and so forth. So there's a, there's a recursive formula proved by Kuntsevich that computes all these numbers. Um, I think that's fairly convincing evidence that this is an interesting question somehow. So. I want to talk now about how one generalizes this question into the setting of symplectic manifolds. And, uh, well, I mean, why this is, in some sense, a natural question uh, to think about in symplectic geometry, in particular. 
uh, and how one does it in, in, in particular cases, uh, what kind of analytical subtleties arise in defining this and how you overcome them. So, here's the setting in symplectic geometry. M is always going to be a closed two n dimensional symplectic manifold. And once I have that data, I can define this set J of M omega. So this is the set of so-called omega tame, almost complex structures. Okay, this is something we need because we want to be able to say what it means for a map from a Riemann surface into M to be holomorphic. And in order to define the Cauchy-Riemann equations that tell you what holomorphic means, you need to be able to multiply by i on tangent spaces. You need each tangent space to be a complex vector space. So that means this thing is literally the set of all sections of the endomorphism bundle of the tangent bundle, Tm, with the property that j squared acts like multiplication by i, so it equals j squared is minus the identity. Uh, and then there's a compatibility condition with the symplectic form. There's two sort of closely related ways you can express this. I'll just write down the simplest one, which is what we call taming omega of x with jx is always a positive number for all non-zero vectors x. All right, so one can actually define a slightly more stringent condition as well, where pairing two vectors in this way with j in the middle gives you a Riemannian metric on m. Then we say uh, j is compatible with omega. For everything I'm going to say, it doesn't matter whether you take that version of the definition or this one, everything turns out the same. So I'll say tame, just to make my life simpler at the moment. And we have this basic lemma that this space of tame, almost complex structures is always non-empty. And it's also contractible. So for our purposes, the basic thing that means is that between any two choices of almost complex structure, right, there's, it's, an, it's always a non-canonical choice of almost complex structure that's tamed by omega, but given any two choices, you can at least find a homotopy between them. And contractible, of course, means a lot more than that. If you have a loop of things in this uh, space, for example, then you can also always fill in that loop with a disk <coughs> and so forth with higher dimensional spheres. What it really means is that for everything we want to do with this choice of almost complex structure, the choice will not matter. We'll be able to prove that whatever we define is independent of that choice. So, just to be extra concrete, a Riemann surface for me always means a closed connected surface with an almost complex structure. I usually denote that by little j or something similar. And then we say a smooth map u from a Riemann surface sigma to m is j holomorphic, also known as pseudo-holomorphic, if the derivative of the map commutes with the complex structures you have on the tangent spaces. So tu composed with little j is the same as big j composed with tu. So a useful fact about that to understand, I mean, I, the first time you see this equation, um, I think it's, it's not completely obvious to look at it the way that people who study PDEs look at it. <laughs> but that's what we need to do. And then if you write this down in local coordinates, there's this basic theorem of Gauss from the mid-19th century that on a Riemann surface, you can always find local coordinates that make that almost complex structure look standard. In other words, in what we will call local holomorphic coordinates,
S and T on sigma. So coordinates being holomorphic just means that you apply J to the vector in the S direction, you get the vector in the T direction. And of course, therefore, since J is a complex structure, that means J applied to the vector in the T direction gives you minus the vector in the S direction. So these coordinates always exist. Then you can write down this equation in coordinates, and it becomes partial by S of U plus J at U partial by T of U equals zero. And we usually call this the nonlinear Cauchy-Riemann equation. That's not an eraser. It's nice to be not in Germany and have real erasers, instead of just some running water in the corner and a piece of cloth. Right. So having defined what it means for a map to be a J-holomorphic curve, I can define now moduli spaces of these things. So people who are really serious about Gromov-Witten theory like to talk about the, mo the so-called moduli space of stable maps, uh, which is, I assume, something that you heard more about from Ritwick. I'm not really going to tell you what a stable map is, but I'm going to start with something a little bit simpler and just talk about the moduli space of smooth J-holomorphic curves. So for a choice of almost complex structure in this space of tamed things, and then for a couple of integers, G and M, and a homology class A in H2 of the symplectic manifold, I will usually abbreviate this thing by m sub j, or m of j, but if I want to be extra explicit, I'll write m subscript gm of a comma j. And what I mean by this is the following set of equivalence classes. I have tuples consisting of sigma little j capital theta u, where sigma with j is just a Riemann surface, of genus G. Theta is an ordered set of points, M points specifically. I should say M distinct points in that domain sigma. And then U is, of course, a J-holomorphic map from sigma with little j to m with big j. In addition, satisfying the following, I'll say the homology class of this map, denoted by u in brackets, this is defined just as the push forward of the fundamental class of the Riemann surface. That's some class in H2 of m. I want it to be a, this thing that I fixed. Okay, so it's that set of tuples, but I need to also def <laughs> divide this by an equivalence relation. And the point of the equivalence relation is, you think about the original example of the line through two points, or a curve through 3D minus one points, as the case may be. Uh, what we're interested in this picture is not the actual map that sends a Riemann surface to CP2, but it's the image of that map in this case at least, where we're not worried about multiplicity, if two maps are just reparameterizations of one another, then we want to consider them equivalent. So I'm going to say a tuple sigma j theta u is always equivalent to a tuple of the form sigma prime phi star j phi inverse of theta u composed with phi for any diffeomorphism 
phi from sigma prime to sigma. Okay. So that's all I need to say in order to define this object as a set. Yes. Uh, well, it automatically is because I chose this to be the complex structure. Yes. So, I mean, that's another way of saying it. That, uh, this tuple is equivalent to some other tuple if there is a, a holomorphic diffeomorphism from one to the other, which sends marked points to marked points and sends the map to this thing. Yeah. A biholomorphic reparameterization. Good. I want to think of this also as at least a topological space. Of course, I'd really like it to be a smooth manifold later on. Uh, it'll turn out that it's not always, but I can certainly put a topology on it. And let's just pretend that defining a topology is the same thing as defining what convergence means. Okay, of course, in reality, you have to do a little bit more. You should assure yourself in the beginning that it's a, at least a metrizable topology, and then it's enough to describe what convergence means. I'm just going to say we'll topologize this set of equivalence classes by the following condition. The equivalence classes of sequences sigma, j, k, theta, u, k. So here, I'm letting the complex structure and the map vary, but my domain and my marked points are fixed. And I will say that this converges to the equivalence class sigma j theta u, if and only if. Now it's obvious what I should say. I should, should ask for jk to converge to j and uk to converge in u. And at this point, you could say various things about precisely what kind of convergence you want. The, for a differential geometer, I think the most natural thing to say is in C infinity for each of these. So note, if you have a sequence of objects uh, with different surfaces as uh, domains and different sets of marked points, if you at least know that the surfaces all have the same genus as sigma and there's the same number of marked points, then you can always choose parameterizations that look like this, that identify the, the domains with sigma and fix the marked points in place. Right? You can choose some diffeomorphism that sends the marked points to the right set of endpoints. So this is, uh, I don't lose any generality by just saying what it means for these kinds of sequences. But of course, in the sequence, uh, the topological type of your domains has to be all the same, at least for sufficiently large k. All right, so what important observation about this definition, um, right? It consists of not just j holomorphic maps, but also there's this extra set of data, the m points. What I can do with that is ask, what is the value of the map at each one? And that's well defined because of the way I define the equivalence relation. So in particular, there exists a continuous map from this moduli space to the m-fold product of our symplectic manifold with itself, denoted by EV for evaluation, that's the evaluation map. It sends the equivalence class of sigma j, now let's write theta as an actual ordered m-tuple of points, theta 1 through theta m, to the m tuple u of zeta 1 through u of zeta m. So clearly that's well defined according to the way my equivalence relation was defined. And then another definition which I'll need to spend some time explaining what it means 
is the virtual dimension of the moduli space. So this is a little bit of index theory. What's in the background is there is some Fredholm operator that we get by linearizing the, this elliptic nonlinear cauchy riemann equation, and its index is the following. I'll denote ver dim of MGMAJ. At the moment, this is just a definition, and it's an integer. It's the number n minus 3 times 2 minus 2g plus 2 times first churn class evaluated on a plus 2m. So this is a bit of shorthand notation. When I write c1 of a, what I mean is uh, sorry, the first churn class of the complex vector bundle tm with its complex structure j evaluated on the homology class A. And this integer will also be often referred to as the index of U for any given element U in the moduli space. OK, so I'll say some more about uh, why that is true. But for now, well, The motivation for that definition is that sometimes the moduli space I defined will turn out to be a smooth manifold of precisely that dimension, which means if that dimension happens to be negative, it just means that the moduli space is empty. Or if it's zero, then the moduli space is this discrete set of points. These are somehow the interesting cases. So let's talk about what works now in the ideal case. which I subtitle science fiction. Because the conditions that you need to make the following true are almost never actually satisfied. Yeah. Well, OK, it depends on U up to homotopy, at least. Right, so it depends on the genus of U of uh, the domain of U, and it depends on the homology class that U is representing. Yeah. So, I mean, you're right in the sense that if you deform U through its moduli space continuously, the index won't change. So, <clears throat> the science fiction case, let's impose the assumption that this moduli space, I'm just abbreviating it now, uh, abbreviating by M of J, is a compact, smooth, and oriented manifold of dimension equal to its virtual dimension. So we like to imagine that this is always true. And a lot of the work we have to do that I'll tell you about in the, the next few talks uh, will be about what to do when we find out that this is not true and how to fix the theory we're trying to define. So, if this is true, then we could define the following. I'll denote the invariant by GW subs uh, superscript M omega subscript GM A. This is going to be a homomorphism from the m-fold tensor product of the cohomology of m to the integers, setting a product of cohomology classes alpha 1 through alpha m to the following. So first of all, in most circumstances, it will just send them to 0. In particular, that will be the answer whenever the sum of the degrees of these cohomology classes is different from the virtual dimension of the moduli space.
The interesting case is, of course, when those two numbers are equal. This condition is, is telling us something about complementary dimensions in computing an intersection number. Or we could also express it the following way. So if these things are equal, it means the dimension of that moduli space is the same as the degree of the cohomology class you get as the cut product of these m classes. Which means now then I can imagine integrating that cohomology class over the moduli space, or I'm evaluating that cohomology class on the fundamental class of the moduli space. We traditionally write that as an integral, integral over the moduli space m of j of the pulled back cohomology classes ev1 star alpha 1 cup cup evm star alpha m. So here there's a bit of notation that I forgot to define. I'm writing the evaluation map as an m tuple of maps e1 through evm from the moduli space to the m-fold Cartesian product of m. Okay, so that defines each of these individual maps to m, and then I can pull back the cohomology classes accordingly and have cohomology classes on the moduli space. Now, the right way to really think of this integral is as a computing an intersection number. And when we try to give rigorous definitions of this, uh, that's usually the right way to go about it, is to define an intersection number. So, in particular, you could also say that is the intersection number of the map of from the moduli space which right now is a closed manifold by assumption to the m-fold tensor product of m with the homology class in this product that you get by taking the Poincaré duals of the alpha and you take their cross product. All right, so that's some homology class in the m-fold Cartesian product. of our symplectic manifold, and we can take that intersection number. That's well defined as long as the evaluation map is continuous and its domain is a closed-oriented manifold, which I assumed. Uh, you get an integer from that. Um, now, if that's your interpretation, then to get back to the original question from enumerative algebraic geometry, you can interpret this as follows. If you pick some smooth manifolds that represent these homology classes, then what you're looking for is uh, you are counting actual j holomorphic curves that satisfy a constraint given by those submanifolds. Namely, this is the number of curves in the moduli space with marked points theta equals zeta 1 through zeta m, satisfying the constraints u of zeta i is in some submanifold I'll denote by alpha i bar for i equals 1 through m, where alpha i bar are generic submanifolds in M, representing the Poincaré dual of alpha i. Homologically. Right. So thinking of it as an intersection number tells you that the answer only depends on those submanifolds up to homology. Therefore, it only depends on the cohomology classes of the alphas. And of course, it also... It, it, um, how should I say? As well as the homology class represented by the curves you're counting, 
But thinking of it in this last way gives it the relationship with the enumerative question I asked at the beginning. You're actually counting holomorphic curves that satisfy particular constraints. Right? So the particular case I talked about at the beginning was where these cohomology classes uh, are Poincaré dual to the homology class of a point. So they have the, the maximal degree in that case. And then you're just asking for a generic set of m points representing the homology class of a point. And that's your constraint. Okay. So under this assumption, I can now state a theorem. I'm putting the word theorem in quotation marks since it's based on the set of assumptions which I called science fiction, but we get some useful ideas out of this in any case. This homomorphism GW depends on omega up to smooth deformation through symplectic forms. But it does not depend on J. So that's the sense in which this question from enumerative algebraic geometry actually becomes more natural in the context of symplectic topology. Let me quickly sketch the proof of this, again based on this wildly optimistic set of assumptions. So we want to show that we'll always get the same numbers if we've got two different almost complex structures and also two different symplectic forms that can be deformed to each other through symplectic forms. Well, if I'm given such a deformation, call it omega s of symplectic forms, the fact that the space of tame almost complex structures is contractible, one of the things that tells me is that I can now choose a one-parameter family of j's that accompany this deformation of omegas. Let's choose a family js belonging to the spaces j of uh, m omega s with the same parameter. And we can use that data to define a variation on our original moduli space. <clears throat> I'll call it mgm a in terms of the family of almost complex structures js. We define this to be the set of pairs, S and U, where S is just one of these parameters in the unit interval, and U belongs to the moduli space MGMA for the particular almost complex structure JS. So that's another thing that carries a natural topology defined in the same way as before. Now one has to do a little bit of work, one has to prove that that also is a smooth manifold of one dimension more than the space I've been talking about until now. And in fact, we want to prove that it is a compact cobordism. Whose boundary is the two moduli spaces you get for J0 and J1. In other words, you have the S equals 1 part, 1 times moduli space for J1, disjoint union, the S equals 0 part, and I have to also reverse the orientation of one of them, let it be the 0 part. Okay. So, of course, there's a bit of work to be done there. That doesn't even follow in any automatic way from the assumptions that I stated. You might have to impose some more assumptions to get that result. But in fortunate cases, that will turn out to be true. It, gen it, it wants to be true. I'll put it that way. It wants to be true, and there are specific reasons that will sometimes prevent it from being true. But if you have that cobordism structure, then of course we know the fact that intersection numbers are cobordism invariants. So the intersection number 
of the evaluation map restricted to the J0 moduli space will then be the same as for the J1 moduli space because you can extend the evaluation map the cobordism. And really, the nice way to think about that is to say, since you can extend the evaluation map over this parametric moduli space, now you can look at ev inverse of this set of submanifolds, alpha 1 bar times, etc., alpha m bar. That's going to be generically a one-dimensional submanifold of our cobordism. A compact one-dimensional submanifold with boundary. And this is my chance to say anyone who hasn't read Milner's book, Topology from the Differentiable Viewpoint, really should read it. I mean, everyone in the world probably should read it. Uh, just beautiful book. Tells you nice things like the degree of a map between two closed manifolds of the same dimension is well-defined, and the reason it's well-defined is the following picture. You have this one-dimensional sub-manifold sitting in a cobordism, and its boundary is the set of all points in ev inverse of this product at either the J0 part or the J1 part. So counting those points gives you the two intersection numbers that we're trying to relate to each other. And they're going to be the same because of the fact that they are cobordant to each other through this one-dimensional cobordism. Okay. Um, it's a more convincing picture if I make it not precisely the same number of points on top and bottom. Because you have to count them with signs, of course, so that you get the right answers. Right. So it, this is just appealing to this same fact that you always appeal to in, in every variety of Fleur homology, that the number of points counted with appropriate signs in the boundary of a compact, oriented, one-dimensional manifold with boundary is zero. So that's, that's at least the intuitive reason for the Groen-Witten invariance to be well-defined and dependent only on the deformation class of the symplectic form. So what I want to talk about now is um, what are the specific difficulties that arise that make this set of assumptions unrealistic. So the first one I think you've, you've probably heard about enough from Ritwick, and I'm not going to talk about it very much, that's compactness. And I'm sure other people have also mentioned it. So the first of my assumptions, which doesn't hold in general, is MJ being compact. It's not compact. It's not compact but it does have a natural compactification. This is what we usually call the Gromov compactification. I'm not going to define it, I'll just describe it in a picture. You can imagine this scenario where a family of holomorphic curves, say with genus 2, starts degenerating and looking like something not so smooth. Also not so trivial to draw. Okay, so I have this pinching going on in, in three places at once, so that in the limit, I can describe some object that is a limit of such a sequence, but it's not going to be a smooth holomorphic curve. It's going to be... Oh, I lost genus. Ooh, that's not good. There it is. Found it. Thank you. So my limit could look something like this, for example. So that's not a smooth J-holomorphic curve, but it's actually three J-holomorphic curves 
that exist in some relationship to each other. Uh, there's one genus one curve, and there's a genus zero curve that intersects that genus one curve at some point where some, some pinching has taken place. And it also intersects some other genus zero curve. This is a genus zero curve that intersects itself. We lost genus in some sense, but we still have what we call arithmetic genus, right? Because you, if you take the connected sum of these things at each of the nodal points, you end up again with this genus two surface. So we say this is a holomorphic, a nodal holomorphic curve of arithmetic genus two. All right, so that phenomenon has to be built into the theory somehow. It means, uh, in the best case, what we have is maybe a smooth manifold, but not a compact one, but it's then a smooth manifold sitting inside some compact topological space. And we have to make sure that when we define intersection numbers, uh, nothing goes wrong due to the fact that there's that extra stuff sitting there at infinity, which may or may not be a smooth manifold or whatever else. Right, so that's the first issue. The second one I'll talk more about is transversality. So this refers to the fact that M of J is not always a smooth manifold of the correct dimension. In fact, sometimes it really cannot be. So, I need to say some more precise things about this, and, and thus I need to talk a little bit about the analytical setup for talking about transversality. I don't want to go into too much detail here, but the way to do this is to identify your moduli space, at least locally, with the zero set of some map. And since what we're trying to do is solve a PDE, that has to be a map between infinite dimensional spaces. And in order to apply the analysis we know, we have to have some kind of Banach space setting. So to do this in differential geometry, we talk about Banach manifolds. So infinite dimensional manifolds locally modeled on Banach spaces. B is going to be some infinite dimensional Banach manifold consisting of pairs J and U, J is a complex structure on the domain, U is a map. And let's just focus on some neighborhood of a particular curve. So, this is for some fixed J holomorphic curve, uh, U naught with domain complex structure J0 mapping to M. So I'm trying to understand a neighborhood of the equivalence class represented by this curve in the moduli space. Uh, I should be a little bit more precise. So J, little j here, is going to belong to some finite dimensional parameterized family of complex structures. The point is that I need to parameterize up to all the complex structures that can be deformed into up to diffeomorphism. Okay, so one should really say that in terms of Teichmüller theory, which I don't want to get into here, but there's a finite dimensional space that parameterizes the Teichmüller space of complex structures nearby. Uh, U is going to have to belong to some infinite dimensional object, because I want to allow, in principle, all smooth maps in a neighborhood of U naught. So it's generally best to fix some sort of Sobolev space condition on this. I could say, for instance, U would be of Sobolev class WKP for some natural number K and real number P that's strictly between one and infinity, and then I want to also impose the condition k times p greater than 2. The reason is the Sobolev embedding theorem tells me anything of class WKP satisfying this condition, kp greater than 2, will also be continuous. So u is therefore at least 
C0. And since k is at least one, u is also going to have at least one derivative that will be of class LP. Not necessarily continuous, but I need to be able to talk about derivatives at least in a weak sense. So, if you haven't seen this before, there are a couple of papers that were written in the late 60s that prove that objects like that really can be defined as smooth Banach manifolds. So my favorite is this one by Eliasson called uh, I think something like differential geometry of manifolds of maps. sometimes described as a paper that everybody should read exactly once. Okay, now the next piece of the setup I need is a bundle over that Banach manifold. I'll call it E. This is an infinite dimensional Banach space bundle. And again, I don't want to be too precise about what I assume this bundle to be, but let's write down an example of what it could be. For instance, if I choose u to vary in this Sobolev space of WKP maps, then the fibers of this bundle should be over the pair JU, the Banach space of WK minus 1P sections of the vector bundle Hom bar from T sigma J to U star T M big J. So that's Hom bar means uh, this is the bundle of complex anti-linear maps from T sigma to U star T M. The reason for that definition is that there's a natural section of this Banach space bundle I can write down, whose zero set is precisely the solutions to the nonlinear Cauchy Riemann equation. <laughs> Namely, by j from b to e, the map sending the pair j u to t u of j plus, sorry, not what I want to say exactly, t u plus big J of t u of little j. Okay, so now it's easy to check. This is at least a well-defined section because this associates to any pair J and U an element of this fiber. It's of class WK minus 1P if U is of class WKP because I'm taking a derivative here, so I lost one derivative. So the claim, which I won't prove, is that this is a smooth section. And what you then have to show is that a neighborhood of our fixed curve, or it's, it's the equivalence class of sigma j naught theta u naught in our moduli space can be identified homeomorphically with the zero set of this section divided by some finite group action. There's automorphism group of the curve u naught that acts on this zero set if you set it up correctly. So here, the automorphism group of u naught means the group of all biholomorphic self-maps of its domain which preserve the marked points and satisfy u naught equals u naught of phi. So one can show that that's always a finite group, as long as at least well, there's a stupid case where u naught is a constant map. We don't want to talk about that. So if u naught is non-constant, that's always a finite group. All right. Any questions on this setup before I continue? Yeah. I can't hear you. In your definition of B, yes. Are you modding out by 
Oh, God, no. No, that would kill everything. <laughs> no. So, uh, so B is really... Uh, it is some space of pairs like this, where U is an actual map. It's not an equivalence class of maps up to anything. Ah, uh, okay. Sorry, so there's, there's an aspect of this story that I've left out. So let's silently add the assumption that the number of marked points, so twice the number of marked points plus the genus is greater than or equal to zero. This is a stability condition. If you don't have that assumption, then the issue you have is that there's a, a non-trivial Lie group of automorphisms of the Riemann surfaces preserving the marked points. And so I, then if I have that, I'm not going to change my definition of the Banach manifold, uh, but at some point toward the end of the discussion, I need to actually divide by that group. Well, once I look at this zero set, now I have a finite dimensional manifold to work on, which this Lie group is acting smoothly on. So then I'm, I'm safe in dividing out that group action. Right. So I'd need to modify this story a little bit at that point. Uh, I can't do it at an earlier point. I can't have this Lie group acting on the infinite dimensional Banach space and then divide it out already at that stage because I, well, it does not act smoothly on the infinite dimensional space. I have to be careful about this. Okay. So. Right, so now I can give you an important definition. We say, I'm going to just abbreviate elements in the moduli space by U when there's no danger of confusion. So by U, I'm just I'm abbreviating the equivalence class sigma j theta U. And I will say that this element is so-called Fredholm regular often I'll just say regular, if this section d bar j is transverse to the zero section at the point j u in my Banach manifold. So it's a transversality condition living in infinite dimensions. Uh, another way to say the same thing Right? You should maybe picture the finite dimensional analog of this. If this is the zero section of some vector bundle, and then I have another section sometimes intersecting it, now let's make it a worse intersection. And I can have them intersect along a whole interval, for example. So I've got several transverse intersections, but the regularity condition will fail along this interval of intersections, because there's no transversality. The point is, of course, in my picture, if you just look at the transverse intersections, the set of those intersections is a zero-dimensional manifold. It's a discrete set of points. So the equivalent way to state this transversality condition is to say the linearization of my section will denote by D so capital D of D bar J, that is a bounded linear map from the tangent space at little j u of the Banach manifold to the fiber over the same point. And in general, this is a Fredholm operator. Whose index is precisely what I've been calling the virtual dimension up until now. That's why we call it index of U. This is another detail that I need to modify a little bit if I have uh, a non-trivial lead group of automorphisms to worry about. But let's ignore that for the moment. So this linearization needs to be surjective. Now, if you have this condition, the implicit function theorem tells you something useful. So the, the infinite dimensional implicit function theorem for a smooth map whose derivative is Fredholm tells you that if that derivative is surjective, uh, 
then the zero set of that map, d bar j inverse of zero, near ju, is a smooth manifold of dimension equal to the index of u. So that's nice, if that's true. So when is that true? Now, what you'd hope to be able to say, and in fact you can say this, we have our section, now it will be true for a generic perturbation of this section that all intersections with the zero section are transverse. Uh, but a generic perturbation of this section may be a very abstract object, it may be more abstract than what we'd really like to talk about. We'd prefer to keep talking about solutions of the nonlinear cauchy riemann equation, not just some perturbation of that equation. So one natural thing you can do is you can perturb the almost complex structure. That realizes some perturbation of this section. Um, is that generic enough to always get transversality? The answer is not quite, but it's pretty good. So the theorem, I'll sketch the proof of this in my next talk tomorrow. For a dense, actually generic, so it's a little bit more than dense. It's actually uh, a countable intersection of open and dense subsets. So that's the infinite dimensional version of almost everywhere. Uh, outside of a set of measure zero, the following is true. So let's say for a dense subset, J reg, in the space of tame almost complex structures, if J belongs to J reg, then all so-called simple, meaning not multiply covered, J holomorphic curves in this moduli space are regular. Okay. So that's a nice fact, but of course it's going to run into the problem that multiply covered curves do exist in general. I'll come back to that subject and say actually quite a lot more about it uh, in the next three talks. Let me first address a third concern. We talked about compactness and transversality. There's one other issue that makes my optimistic assumptions usually not true, and that is that there's also symmetry. And you can already sort of see the problem in what I wrote down here. If you have the transversality condition, then this zero set d bar j inverse of zero is a nice smooth manifold. But I didn't claim that that's locally what the moduli space looks like. What I said was the moduli space looks locally like, where is it? That zero, section, uh, zero set divided by some finite group action. So the trouble here is because of that automorphism group, we have this local identification with something that is a nice, well-behaved a uh, finite dimensional manifold divided by a finite group action. So if transversality holds, then still what we have is not quite a manifold, but is a smooth orbifold.
And that's something that uh, you already run into this issue before ever talking about J holomorphic curves, actually, because you can talk about the moduli space of J holomorphic curves mapping to a point. What you're actually talking about then is the moduli space of Riemann surfaces and its compactification is the Deline Mumford compactification. That's an object which has a natural smooth structure, but it's not a manifold. It also has this issue with finite group actions, so it becomes an orbifold instead. So you have to confront orbifolds at some point in this story. I'm not going to say very much about this. I'm just going to tell you what the consequence is that the gromov witten counts you're trying to define are not going to be integers. They're going to have to be rational numbers. So this map GW from the m-fold tensor product of the homology takes you to the rational numbers in general, not the integers. That's because there's, a, there's some simple exercises you can do to convince yourself of this. If you're trying to define a, a count of number of points in an orbifold, or say, let's say you have a, a vector bundle satisfying some symmetry, so it's actually not a vector bundle, but an orbi bundle over an orbifold. Uh, that's the same thing as uh, looking at sections of a vector bundle which have some symmetry built in. Now, if that symmetry is always there and you want to be able to count the zeros of your section in a way that's homotopy invariant, you have to define a rational count. It's no longer an option to just count points with signs. You have to also count points with signs and divide by the local isotropy group of the orbifold at each point. And then you get something that's homotopy invariant. It has to respect the symmetry. All right. That's not something I'll say much about, but I, I need to say it once just so that uh, when I talk about rational gromov witten counts, you don't think I'm making things unnecessarily complicated. All right, so... <clears throat> yeah. So... That's true in some cases. I'll talk, I'm, I'll talk now about the semi-positive case in particular. So in the semi-positive case, um, you actually get integer-valued counts. Um, well, no, you don't always. There's, there's, there's a couple of subtle, subtle issues involved. So yeah. ask your question again in five minutes. Maybe I can say more. So, I want to describe very briefly one of the solutions to the transversality pro problem, which doesn't work in arbitrary symplectic manifolds, but does work in a wide class of them, which will be my focus. So, this is, uh, there's sort of two versions of this that are standard in the literature. There's one that's described in the textbook by Macduff and Zalaman. I'm going to be following the other one, which is in a couple of papers of Juan and Tien from the mid-1990s. So, the idea here is, well, I indicated before, we have this smooth section, it's very naturally defined, but it won't always satisfy the transversality condition we want. And perturbing J is not always good enough to make that happen. But abstractly, we know we can always perturb the section itself generically so that we get transversality. That means we're going to modify the Cauchy-Riemann equation a little bit. So the idea here is to replace the equation d bar j equals zero by something of the form d bar j of u equals a non-zero thing called nu in most of the papers about this. So here, this object on the right-hand side, the inhomogeneous perturbation, nu, depends at least on z and p, so this means its value at z and p is a complex anti-linear homomorphism 
from Tz sigma to Tpm. And we'll say it depends generically on Z in sigma and also on P in M. And there's a bit more dependence that I haven't built into the notation, but we want it to also depend generically and on the equivalence class of my domain complex structure in the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. So, and actually, I'm going to put a bar over that to make it the compactified, so the Deline Mumford moduli space. Um, the reason for that dependence is that if I perturb the equation in this way, I can achieve transversality. Uh, but I want to make sure that that perturbation is not just going to turn itself off if I have a sequence of curves converging to some nodal curve that has now a nodal domain. Right? I want that perturbation to also be working its magic if I converge to that limit. So it needs to move along with the domain complex structure as the domains degenerate. Now this uh, strategy gives me a new slightly modified moduli space, which I'm going to denote by M of J nu. And in fact, this is guaranteed to be a manifold of dimension equal to the virtual dimension if the inhomogeneous perturbation nu is chosen generically. Okay. So if you haven't seen this at all before, I'll just ask you to believe me about that, but uh, I'll discuss tomorrow a little bit the kinds of methods you need to prove a statement like that. Now, getting back to the question Ritwick act asked, a few minutes ago. I'm no longer, there's no longer any symmetry in the picture. Once I have the inhomogeneous perturbation, uh, it's sort of designed to destroy whatever symmetry is there. And that's why I get a manifold rather than an orbifold. Uh, but there's a couple of issues here. One is that I asked for the inhomogeneous perturbation to depend generically on the position of the domain complex structure in the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. It needs to depend smoothly on that, uh, but that moduli space is already not a manifold, it's an orbifold to begin with. So in order to handle that issue, I actually need to do something like have the perturbation depend on some lift of J to a finite cover of the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. And then I need to divide in the end by the degree of that cover. So again, I will end up with rational numbers instead of integers in general. That's one of the issues. Another is that in order to talk about J depending on the moduli space of Riemann surfaces in that way, the moduli space of Riemann surfaces needs to be a nice, well-behaved object, which you may have heard before is only true under the stability condition. You need 2G plus M to be at least 3. And uh, so, of course, we're still interested in defining these invariants in, in situations where 2G plus M is not at least 3. Okay. Uh, you have to do an extra step in that case. You have to relate the gromov witten invariants uh, for your given G and M to invariants that have more marked points so that the stability condition is satisfied, but then you apply some constraints that uh, make that problem equivalent to the one without the constraints, without the extra marked points. Problem is when you do that, you're usually going to overcount. You have some extra choices. It's a combinatorial problem. You have to divide by some combinatorial constant in the end to avoid overcounting. Okay. So the answer actually, in some sense, depending on precisely how you choose to solve your technical problems, you 
you may, have, you may end up with different explanations of why the answer is always a rational number, not an integer.、Um, but it will always turn out that way. <laughs> All right. So let me state a theorem about this approach. And that is that if m omega is what we call semi positive, I'm not going to define what that means because I just need a special case of it. Semi positive is a condition that, in particular, is always true if the dimension of m is at most six. So that's actually the assumption that I'm going to work with most. Then it turns out that if you take the evaluation map and restrict it to only the bad stuff in the compactified moduli space, so you take the compactified moduli space and remove the non nodal elements of that space. Now, it turns out this restriction always factors through a smooth map defined on a countable union of manifolds of dimension less than or equal to the virtual dimension minus two. So, if you've seen this terminology before, what I'm actually saying here is that the evaluation map is a so called pseudo cycle, which means it has a well defined intersection theory just by restricting it to the nice smooth part of the moduli space, even if that's not a compact manifold.、Right? This condition here、uh, makes it possible to ignore the compactification and just talk about the smooth part. For dimensional reasons. It's telling that when you try to count intersections, you're not going to have a sequence of intersections lost as you go out to infinity, because at infinity, there won't be any intersections due to this condition here. This,、uh, there's not enough dimensions to have intersections there. So, what I'm saying is the intersection number of Evaluation map just restricted to this smooth moduli space of inhomogeneously perturbed solutions, and this product of Poincare dual cohomology classes. That is going to be now our definition of the Gromov Witten invariant. And that is well defined. And deformation invariant. <laughs> yeah. Sorry? I don't need Gini Zero. That's why I'm following Ron and Tian instead of McDuff and Zalaman. So, Macduff and Zalaman do something a little bit different in their book. They don't use the inhomogeneous perturbation nu. Instead, They keep this, this equation d bar j u equals zero, but they allow j to depend generically on the position in the domain. So that solves the transversality problem,、uh, at least for the genus zero case. They don't explain much in their book about how to handle the higher genus case.、It's, I think the higher genus case is easier to do with this inhomogeneous perturbation instead.、Okay. They do, one thing they do explain in their book is that in the genus zero case, you actually do end up with integer valued invariants for semi positive symplectic manifolds,、um, due to the fact that you can now just talk about intersection numbers between a manifold and some homo homology classes.、Um, but in the higher genus case, again, that's not true due to the fact that the moduli space of Riemann surfaces is not a manifold. Okay, let's make more room. 
The last thing I want to talk about today is a particular situation in which my science fiction assumption is not just improbable, but is definitely false. So this is the so-called Kalabi Yao case. So let's suppose n equals 3, so my symplectic manifold is dimension 6, and its first Chern class is 0. So that's in particular something that's true for every so-called Kalabi Yao threefold. And we generalize that a bit and just call a symplectic manifold a symplectic Calabi Yau threefold or symplectic Calabi Yau six manifold if it satisfies these two conditions. The point of these conditions is that every holomorphic curve, remember the formula was with the index n minus three times the Euler characteristic of the domain plus twice the first churn number. First churn number now vanishes and n minus three also vanishes. So all holomorphic curves now have index zero. So, it, yeah. Multiply covered curves don't exist anymore with, with the perturbation. Right? The, the notion of multiply covered doesn't make sense. Uh, I'll talk about multiple covers a little bit more in a moment, but once you've introduced an inhomogeneous perturbation, you can't just take a branch cover of Riemann surfaces and compose that with a J holomorphic curve and say that the composition satisfies that equation. It won't satisfy that equation. Well, I introduced the perturbation partly in order to get rid of multiple covers because they cause problems with transversality. Right? Once the perturbation is there, you no longer have any problems with transversality, at least on the uncompactified moduli space. You have to worry a little bit about the compactified moduli space, and that's why we ended up with this extra condition, semi-positive. Uh, it turns out to be okay if the dimension of the manifold is at most six. That's a long story, which I won't get into here. Um, but yes, the point of the inhomogeneous perturbation is really to solve the transversality problem, in part by completely getting rid of the notion of multiply covered curves. That's going to be the general definition of gromov witten invariance for my purposes, yes. Um, but I will, also t I will continue to talk about the moduli space where nu equals zero. And whenever I don't put nu in the notation, I mean just the space of J-holomorphic curves, as before. Yeah. Ye well, at least a sufficiently large portion of the science fiction assumption holds if you put new in the picture. Yes. Under, under an extra assumption that I have up here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I'm mostly not going to talk about new anymore, though, because I, I don't want to talk about solutions to this perturbed equation. I'd really rather talk about actual J-holomorphic curves. They're more natural. Uh, if you want to actually make a count explicitly, it's much easier to understand the solutions of the unperturbed cauchy riemann equation. So this is the main thing I want to talk about. Now I have a problem, right? Because my science fiction assumption would say in this kalabi yau setting, uh, the moduli space should always be a zero-dimensional manifold. So a discrete set, that would mean all the holomorphic curves are isolated. What I can say is at least if J is generic, then if U is a simple curve, meaning not a multiple cover, it will be isolated in the moduli space. The moduli space of simple curves is now a zero-dimensional manifold. 
um, just because of this fact that the dimension of the moduli space now equals its virtual dimension, which will be zero. But I have to confront the possibility that I instead have a multiple cover. So literally what this means is U is a map from sigma j to mj as usual, but it factors through a pair of maps. Phi goes from sigma j to sigma prime j prime, and V goes from there to mj. Now V, I can assume to be a simple j holomorphic curve, and phi I'm going to assume is a default, in general, branched cover, holomorphic branched cover of Riemann surfaces. And that's what every holomorphic map of non-trivial degree between two closed Riemann surfaces looks like. It's a branched cover possibly with an empty set of branch points, then I, I could also call it an unbranched cover in that particular case. Okay. So, I can now observe the following. A neighborhood of this multi-covered curve U in the moduli space contains the following set. The simple curve V is, of course, isolated, but the holomorphic branched cover phi generally is not. I can perturb that to other nearby branched covers, which are not equivalent up to parameterization. So I get this family of multiple covers. Now I, I, I've taken it out again. Okay, so... <laughs> uh, yes, when I say m of j, and I don't put nu in there, I mean, yeah. So, as I said, I'd really rather talk about honest j holomorphic curves, not solutions of the perturbed equation. We learn some things from that moduli space that we wouldn't otherwise see. So, now I have this set of perturbed holomorphic curves. V is the same curve, but phi prime belongs to the moduli space of genus G holomorphic curves in the Riemann surface that is the domain of V. So let's say its homology class is D times the fundamental class of that domain. And it's little j prime holomorphic. Now that is not a discrete set in general. Actually, the index formula tells me the dimension of this space is so it was n minus 3 times the Euler characteristic of the domain. n now is 1, because we're looking at holomorphic curves in a Riemann surface itself. So that's minus 2 times Euler characteristic of sigma, plus twice the first churn number is, is the same as the first churn number of the pulled back tangent bundle. So that's phi star t sigma prime. So, uh, phi being a map of degree d tells me that this is going to be the same thing as d times c1 of t sigma prime, which is the Euler characteristic of sigma prime. And this whole thing comes out to 2 times minus Euler characteristic of sigma plus d times chi of sigma prime. And if you happen to know the classical riemann hurwitz formula for branched covers off the top of your head, you would recognize what I have in the brackets here. So the riemann hurwitz formula tells you that that integer is the same thing as an algebraic count of the branch points of a branched cover. So what I get can be denoted by two times this algebraic count of, I'll denote crit phi, the set of critical points. And that's, uh, each branch point counts for some positive number. So that's always a non-negative number. And it's strictly positive unless phi has no branch points. 
So in particular, it's not going to be zero. Not equal to the index view or the virtual dimension of the moduli space. So this tells me explicitly that U cannot be regular. if there are branch points. Okay. Um, one of the slightly surprising things that I have to tell you in the next three talks is that if, there, if indeed there aren't branch points, then you will be regular for generic J, even if it's a multiple cover. That doesn't follow from the theorem that I quoted before, and it takes some work to prove that. But what I want to do, um, I want to also say, What's, what's the best thing we could possibly imagine is true, even in this situation where there are branch points? So we can see explicitly that there is this positive dimensional family of curves nearby, uh, which make the actual dimension larger than the virtual dimension. The nicest thing I could imagine might be true is that that positive dimensional family I can see really is all that there is and there's guaranteed to be no other holomorphic curve nearby. In particular, uh, you can't perturb your multiply covered curve to a simple curve, and it cannot, in particular, be the limit of a sequence of simple curves, because all the nearby curves are just other multiple covers of the same simple curve V. So that leads to the following definition. We say a simple curve V is super rigid if, first of all, it is immersed. That's a harmless assumption um, because all the curves have index zero. So actually, being immersed turned out to be a generic property. That's, uh, for the simple curves, that's a standard thing one can prove. But more importantly, for all natural numbers D and all default holomorphic branch covers, phi from some Riemann surface sigma J to sigma prime J prime, the, well, I cannot ask for the linearized cauchy riemann operator here to be surjective. That was my regularity condition. I just established that that can't be true. It's going to have some co-kernel, because its kernel is going to be at least the size of this moduli space of branched covers that I see here. So the best situation possible would be that its kernel is of precisely that size. Uh, that's the condition, the dimension of the kernel of this linearized operator at v of phi is exactly twice the algebraic count of branch points. So the simple curve is super rigid if this condition holds for all of its branched covers. Now, you can use the implicit function theorem in a slightly less straightforward way than before to derive from this the following consequence. A neighborhood, so for all covers u naught of v, a neighborhood of u naught in the moduli space is simply this space of branched covers of the same curve, v of phi. with phi varying in the moduli space of branched covers. So that's the best case scenario. In particular, you don't have any other simple curves nearby. We will talk tomorrow about the following things. First of all, if this is true, uh, then actually there's a, only a finite set of simple curves, uh, because you cannot have an infinite sequence of them converging to a multiple cover. The super rigidity condition prevents that. And then uh, this means you can actually express the Gromov-Witten invariance without having to choose 
a, an inhomogeneous perturbation. You can look at the moduli space of branched covers over a given simple curve. It has a well-defined obstruction bundle. What you need to be able to compute is the Euler number of that obstruction bundle. So I'll talk about that a little bit tomorrow. And then I will also talk about the fact that for generic J, this super-rigidity condition actually always holds. So in Calabia threefolds, you get a nice result that we say it localizes the Gromov-Witten invariance. The Gromov-Witten invariance turn out to depend only on uh, what's going on in arbitrarily small neighborhoods of some finite collection of disjoint embedded curves. Um, along the way, I'll have to talk a little bit about how you can prove that transversality holds sometimes also for multiple covers, not just for simple curves. So that's going to be uh, altogether the content of the next three lectures. But for today, I'll stop there. Super rigid, uh, super rigid curves are regular as a consequence of the fact that D can be 1 in this definition. Uh, so you can take phi to be the identity, and then this condition just says that the dimension of this kernel is 0. It's, a, it's an index 0 Fredholm operator in that case, so having trivial kernel means it also has trivial co-kernel. Yeah. Theorem you have stated, I think you need one more condition. I think you have to say what non trivial multiple of a class whose first year number is zero. No, semi positive no. eliminates that. Eh? No didn't say, I, well, I intentionally didn't write anything about integers here. Right. So uh, the reality for Calabi-Yau threefolds is, uh, right, you, right, you, right, so the definition, okay, <sighs> let me try and say this carefully. Okay, I'm going to add two things. First, 2g plus m greater than or equal to zero, so that I can define this moduli space properly in the first place. And then, what I really should do to define this is, right, nudes depending generically on something in deline mumford space, which is an orbifold rather than a manifold. So I need to actually have it depend on something in a finite cover of that space. And then I take this intersection number. Here I'm only talking about manifolds. This intersection number is well defined. But then I have to divide by the degree of that cover. That's why I end up with something rational. In, in the, this is certainly not always going to be an integer. Right. And, and I can remove this condition. I sort of said this quickly before, I can remove this by adding some auxiliary marked points which are supposed to satisfy constraints that aren't geometrically meaningful. They're just the constraints that are always satisfied. Right? That establishes this condition, but then I have some combinatorics. I have to divide by uh, some overcount, which also gives me something rational. the speaker.